Now, Nicholas Biddle's issue is going to be that the charter for the bank, which he has helped develop practically since its beginning, is going to expire in 1836. So he knows he has about eight years to get the charter for this second national bank re-upped. He also knows that that's probably going to occur on Andrew Jackson's watch, and he knows that Andrew Jackson is not a big fan of the bank. So he's got to figure out a way around this problem. And what Nicholas Biddle decides to do is he decides to enlist the help of another politician, a very powerful politician, by the name of Henry Clay. And what Henry Clay advised Nicholas Biddle to do, and what Henry Clay helped Nicholas Biddle do eventually, was to introduce a new bill to recharter the bank four years early in 1832. Now, Henry Clay's strategy on this, or his thinking behind this, was that um, he knew Andrew Jackson would veto any bill that was passed by Congress regarding a recharter of the bank. And he assumed that any veto that Andrew Jackson implemented would become a political liability for him in his reelection in 1832. Henry Clay, by the way, was also planning on running for the presidency in 1832. And so he thought, well, this will be a good way to slap my adversary with a political liability. Now, Henry Clay ends up really misjudging, miscalculating the popular sentiment of the people towards the Second National Bank. I just said earlier that, you know, most people in the 19th century didn't really like the idea of banks much. Banks were not necessarily particularly reputable. But um, Henry Clay, perhaps because he was living in a bit of a myopia after being in politics for so long, really understood that the National Bank did help stabilize and advance the American economy in many ways, and he assumed that everyone else saw the advantages of that. But again, this was a miscalculation. There were not political polls like there are today that constantly judge the sentiments of the average person out there. And so Henry Clay, like all politicians, was flying blind relative to today's politicians and the constant polling that takes place today. So Andrew Jackson goes ahead as planned and vetoes, or as expected, and vetoes the charter for the bank. However, this does not turn out to be a political liability at all, and in fact, it makes him quite popular in America. He wins the election of 1832 against Henry Clay quite handedly. In fact, the electoral count was 219 to 49. So, now the National Bank is obviously in trouble because they've made Andrew Jackson angry. He knows that this was a political maneuver to um, make him look bad in the first place. He knew the bank was coming after him. Now he's got four more years in power and he's got a political mandate to get rid of the bank. And indeed, he's going to do just that, or at least attempt to do just that. <clears throat> so the first thing that Jackson decides to do in 1833 is to command his Secretary of the Treasurer to start withdrawing, or rather to stop making deposits of federal money into the Second National Bank, which was what was supposed to be done according to the laws set out in the Charter. That was still active, remember? The original charter still has four more years on the books. Now, um, the Secretary of the Treasury is going to say, well, no, we can't do that. He's going to continue to put federal deposits in there. He feels that it is unethical to violate the charter like that. Um, and in fact, Jackson goes through two Secretary of Treasurers before he enlists a friend as his Secretary of the Treasurer. Roger B. Taney. So he gets Roger B. Taney, a close friend of his, in that position, and Roger B. Taney eventually stops depositing federal monies into the Second National Bank. Well, now it's Nicholas Biddle's play. Nicholas Biddle knows what Jackson is trying to do. Jackson is trying to weaken the bank, show everybody that we don't really need this large centralized financial institution, that we can get along just fine with state banks and local private banks. So, um, to make sure that people can feel the need for the bank, um, Nicholas Biddle uses the fact that Andrew Jackson is no longer depositing monies into the federal bank to start 
contracting credit. So again, Nicholas Biddle uses this uh, tactic by Andrew Jackson, this decision to stop depositing money into the national bank in order to say, well, since we're no longer receiving federal deposits, it's time for us to call in all our loans. What he does, what Nicholas Biddle does consciously is he contracts the amount of credit available in the country. He contracts credit, he calls in loans. Now, as we're probably all aware of today, because of our current financial crisis, calling in credit and the contraction of credit has adverse reactions on the economy. It inhibits all growth in many respects. So, a small recession ensues because of Nicholas Biddle's actions. Now, in some respects, one could say that Jackson stopping these deposits would eventually have ramifications on the economy as well. But Nicholas Biddle's actions have more direct effect on the economy. And so, as I said, the country goes into a recession and both Nicholas Biddle and Andrew Jackson are in a standoff of sorts over this issue. And the country is being held liable. <clears throat> Now, eventually what's going to happen is that Nicholas Biddle uh, is going to end up feeling a lot of political pressure. So is Andrew Jackson. But it turns out that Andrew Jackson is able to weather the political pressure a little longer than Nicholas Biddle is. Nicholas Biddle's business associates and friends start to really come down on him hard because this financial crisis is affecting them as much as it is anybody. And so finally Nicholas Biddle decides to extend or rather allow for more free-flowing credit again. And as soon as he lowers interest rates and allows for greater loans to take place, the American economy immediately revives. And so what this vindicates for everybody is the idea that this bank was really quite dangerous in the first place. Americans, again, had been nervous about a large financial institution that would have so much control over the economy because they knew eventually some man or some set of men would control that financial institution which controlled the economy. And that, of course, could lead to despotism and manipulation of the economy for their own gain. And this seems to be a perfect example of that. Nicholas Biddle had contracted credit solely for the purpose of moving forward his own agenda, at least in the eyes of the American people. Because of this, Public sentiment for the bank just plummets, and in 1836, the bank charter expires, and the Second National Bank is no more. Now, it should be said, however, that because there is no longer a centralized financial institution, the American economy suffers quite a bit throughout the 19th century. As you go in and study the 19th century, you will see that we have some really severe boom and bust cycles, particularly as we get into the Industrial Age. And a lot of this is because for about 70 years there, we were operating without any centralized institution that could reign in control of the economy and kind of act as a stabilizing element, if you will. All right, so there's an example of a video. Remember to put the names, the dates, why the subject that you've chosen or you've been assigned to is important, whether it's long-term historical implications and that sort of thing. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me either through the discussion board or via email. All right, welcome to the quarter. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and good luck with your videos.